I used to say, make room at the table. Now I say, just build a bigger table of ideas and opportunities and exploring what is out there. I'm Rich Frazier. And I'm Russ Fanos. Welcome to the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange, a podcast from IPM Advancement. We believe strong nonprofits can change the world. And our goal with each episode is to bring you insightful conversations with thought leaders from the nonprofit sector. Let's dive in. I'm Rich Frazier. My co-host, Russ Faniff, is out on assignment today, and that means that I have the pleasure of bringing you today's episode on Board of Director Diversity, along with my two guests, Andrea King Collier and Josephine Ramirez. Welcome to the show. Could you please introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your backgrounds, especially how it relates to this topic? Andrea, we'll start with you. Well, I'm Andrea Collier, and I'm based in Lansing, Michigan, but most of my work is national. And I started doing nonprofit work because Lansing is the capital of Michigan. And there are lots of nonprofits that I have either served on the boards or have been consultant to. And most recently in the last year or so, I've done a lot of work with boards on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Terrific, and it's a pleasure to have you on the show today, Andrea. Josephine, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm Josephine Ramirez, and I am Executive Vice President of the Music Center Arts, which is the programming division of the Performing Arts Center of Los Angeles County. And I have a long and lurid career in the nonprofit sector, largely in the arts, uh, although I have worked uh, on sort of government across uh, different kinds of sectors and worked in philanthropy on the sort of philanthropic part of the nonprofit sector, working across fields. So I come to the topic as somebody who has worked for pretty much my whole career, trying to focus on bringing the sector and whatever organization I've been involved with into uh, an acknowledgement and focus on becoming more relevant, more diverse, more looking like what their community looks like. Excellent point. And thank you for that. We're going to get into that. So before I ask my first questions of you both, I think it's important to acknowledge to everybody listening that diversity on a nonprofit's board can mean a lot of different things. It can be racial and ethnic diversity, sexual orientation and gender identity, diversity of age, backgrounds, political perspectives and beliefs, diversity of skill sets and professional experience. So we don't want to assume that everybody listening thinks about diversity the same way. And I say that to say this, in a conversation about diversity, it can be too easy to assume that diversity just means racial diversity. Now, of course, racial diversity is a big part of the conversation and it will be a big part of the conversation today. Clearly the nonprofit sector as a whole needs to do a heck of a lot better at attracting and inviting people of color to join boards of directors for a particular purpose, but the same can be true for other aspects of diversity. Bottom line, different organizations will have different definitions for what it means to increase diversity on their boards. So as you're listening, try to find those opportunities that are right for your specific organization and the community you serve. Fair enough, Josephine and Andrea? Yeah, you got it. Okay, so let's jump in then. All of that said, how should boards start defining diversity for themselves? Josephine. I think maybe the first step is realizing what benefits diversity provides on a board and to an organization in order for it to be more effective. And if you think about diversity and the attempt to become more diverse on a board, as an ongoing process, it's going to involve new ongoing ways of operating and it takes effort. You know, it's, it's that phrase, you know, what, what got you here won't get you there kind of equation. First and foremost, it's got to be, you know, a values-based type of commitment, but it's also a very good business sense-based commitment that you can make to your decision-making and to your 
profile of leadership that's really in sync with the community that you're trying to serve. So I would sort of answer the question by saying a top level conversation on the board about why you need it and the advantages that it brings, it will bring to the organization. And then a process that would involve a lot of board members, all of them in some kind of how do we take this on and how do we develop processes in order to achieve more diversity. So defining diversity first, really not about how do we make ourselves look different around the board table, but really how do we do our jobs better? How do we impact our mission better? And what do we need sitting around the board table to do that? I agree with that. And I would say, look at who you serve, not just that you serve, but who are you serving? If you are not diverse in however you define that, then the chances are great that you may not have a strong enough understanding of what the field looks like. If you're, let's say, if you're an arts organization, as an example, how do you know who the emerging artists are or what folks are doing? Or in the case of several boards that I've sat on, they may serve underserved people, but they don't actually understand much about how those people live their lives and how they are having to navigate the world. So in many cases, when boards decide we need to diversify, often they'll say we need a black person or we need a Hispanic person or we need a person with disabilities. I say look at all of that and look at what the board needs in order to make it stronger. It really goes back to purpose. It does. Why do you need this person on the board? Because we need this function executed. We need this job done. We need this connection to that part of the community. And in in, in the case of, say, local boards, I, I mean, I guess I'm proud to say this, but I tend to be the low-hanging fruit. I literally get requests to be on people's boards twice a month. Most of the time now I say no to them because... I just happen to be the black person that they know. Mm -hmm. And so what I'll say to people is go get the ones you don't know. I may be a black female, but I might also sort of live my life in a way that I'm trying to figure out what's going on in the community as much as the people that are already on the board. So let's build a bigger table, right? Yeah. And I, I would jump in and add that what Andrea is saying lends itself to the board doing some kind of assessment about who they already are and where they want to reach toward that will make them better at what they do. And really try to unpack all of those dimensions of diversity. That would give them a sense of some things that they are very weak in and they need to figure out how to deal with Mm -hmm. and other things where they kind of have it covered. So to Andrea's point, not just sort of defaulting to the, the BIPOC person you know, but saying to yourself, okay, what do we need? What are the resources that this person can bring to the table or these people can bring to the table and the, and the kind of dimensions that we are weak in? Exactly. And I think it's, it's more than, I mean, the simple thing for a lot of boards is like, you know, what's their capacity to, to give? And that is a great place to start, <laughs> but people that have the capacity to support are there in the communities of color. It just is going to take them longer because you know people rely on their networks to bring people into boards, and if their networks aren't diverse enough, it's going to take them an extra per- push, and again, that ongoing process that changes the way they would normally do things or the people they would normally go to. So is that what you mean by being an an ongoing process, that that whole networking thing? You wrote an article a while back. It's called, If Your Board Look Like Your Community. And there was a quote in there. I think you were quoting Michael Garces, the artistic director of Cornerstone Theater Company, who said, when it comes to wanting a commitment to diversity, he said, it's something that's long-term and constantly interrogated. It's never going to be solved. 
It's something we practice just like the art form. So why is that perspective important? And what happens if an organization approaches it as, as something to be solved? It's the whole issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an approach to evolution versus doing things the way we always did before. And if you're going to grow into a different way of being, you know, growth doesn't stop. You, you keep going. And, and, you know, it's the nature of boards. People term out. People go on to other things. So you have to have some mechanisms that are ongoing if you truly are committed and have the values that are going to keep informing how they grow. Thank you for that, Josephine. I, I want to back up, Andrea, to something that you said about being asked to serve on a board uh, several times a month. Some practical takeaways for boards who want to be sensitive to those that, that they are recruiting to be on the board and to those that they serve and also avoid tokenism. That is a very interesting question. And I think that we're getting better, but I think in a lot of cases, we are still in the tokenism stage, okay? Mm -hmm. We need a Black woman. We need a Asian man. We need a Native American. One of the things is when the board starts to recruit, they need to be really clear about what it is that they want this person to do besides sit in the diversity chair. Yeah. One of the things that I see that is really problematic for boards is really be clear to when you communicate with potential board members what you're about. There are some boards that we all know that are their main mission is to raise money for the organization. And they need to be really clear about that before a person says yes. Often you will diversify the board and because you have not been clear about what the expectations are, the person just goes away. Yep. Or the person doesn't meet that expectation. I know that when they come to me, that they expect me, they expect me to fill the black girl seat, let's say. But a pleasant surprise is when I bring money to the table. <laughs> or a pleasant surprise is when I'm able to connect them with communities, except I've had boards push back and say, well, we've got research. We don't really need to talk to anybody. And that is my clue that that is not the board for me. Yeah. If you're giving your time, you want to feel like you are making a difference, at least at this stage in my life that I am. So I only I only look at from the perspective of a future board member, how can I serve? And often boards are surprised when people come to, I, I was involved in interviewing, this was a diversity issue of age and gender. And a young woman came to the table to be a future board member and she was wonderful. She had ideas, she was, very voicey ab about what she wanted to see happen. And they were appalled because they, they didn't see that coming. They didn't know that young women now come to the table and are bold enough to say what they want and expect. I thought it was hilarious to watch the looks on the faces of all of the old white guys. <laughs> wow. Does she like drum and bugle corps? Because I got openings on my board of directors. <laughs> But that happens all the time. And you brought up fundraising, which is fascinating, right? Because every board out there that I know of is is interested in fundraising, right? We we all have to be interested in fundraising because it makes the mission happen. But there was an interesting report from Board Source that says those boards that really focus all of their energy on recruitment or fundraising, people who have money or access to money, they really run the risk of losing sight of strategy and mission and impact. Fundraising is one thing, but resource finding is another. And the kinds of resources that a diverse board can bring to the table. I mean, first off, you have to decide, okay, how much do you really have to fundraise through a board? And then kind of have a serious conversation with yourself about who you've got and how you need to augment that to be in a place where you can really start having a conversation about all different kinds of resource finding. And, you know, a lot of organizations are really stuck in the groove of like, I can 
only have people on who are of you know the capacity to give cash. And I, I understand that. And there's a there's a I guess there's a place in every organization's life where they they have to be there. At the same time, if your mission is, say, for example, pre-K education, and you have people that are are gonna give and have the capacity, but they're all kind of the same in terms of their outlook, their background, et cetera. And you've done an assessment and you really need people with resources from other sectors that can add to the kind of um, robustness that you're looking for in your organization. So you need somebody with a, a corporate connection to the food industry. You need somebody with a governmental connection to the you know, supervisorial or, the, or the, the city district that you live in. Then you sort of set it up against a matrix of other kinds of diversity that may have to do with race or class or gender or age or sexual orientation. So then you kind of have a more complex set of things that you're looking for, all with the idea of how do I push our values forward in these selections? So it doesn't, it becomes more than, you know, I need a brown person or I need a black person. It may become, I need somebody with a connection to my council person. And it would be great if it was a brown person. And it would be great if, you know, so it becomes a more real kind of search that you do based on what your real needs are and what's going to push your agenda forward. What you just described, is that uh, basically the protocol that you put in place for the advisory council or the advisory members of the board of the music center? Uh, yeah, I want to talk about that a little bit because um, first off, that was our, our CEO before I got there. She, she did an amazing job of taking a look at the board structure and um, had a brilliant thought partner with the head of our nominating and governance committee chair. And they kind of rethought the idea of a community, I'm putting that in air quotes, community board member. Mm -hmm. The danger in that construct with a lot of nonprofits is that it kind of sets a second or a sub track of board members that are in worst cases looked down upon or in maybe, you know, bad cases, but not the worst cases, they're kind of dismissed because they're not, quote, bringing cash to the table. So you have to be really, really careful with that construct and use it thoughtfully and strategically. So in other words, if you've got a big membership goal that you're going for and you put all of your, quote, diversity candidates in the community advisory board section of your board and and all of the sort of to be blatant like all the rich white people are the ones that are giving money you've like ruined it it's not going to work that way right you need to go out and get the high net worth BIPOC people that are going to meet and beat on that scale in the fundraising and the cash giving and you need to construct your your advisory group and and actually on our board they're not advisors they are full board members they are selected very thoughtfully according to a matrix of like, what kind of resources, non-financial, can we find people to bring to the table? They have to be community leaders in a, in a field that we need a connection to. So for example, um, we do a lot of arts education work. We need somebody that is on there that knows education and they may not be bringing, you know, a huge cash gift, but they're bringing their gravitas and their connections and their voice. So you don't need a, a shrinking violet. <laughs> you need somebody that's going to stand there shoulder to shoulder with the people who are giving cash and say, you know what? I get this. My voice is as important as yours in this discussion. And this is what I'm adding. Going back to Andrea's point about making sure everybody knows what their role is in this organization and what and the value that they bring to the organization. Exactly. One of the things that I would definitely add to that is if you're a decent sized organization or you got a decent sized board, when you embark on this, 
I would do some work with the board before they diversify. You know, it's a good idea and say, we need to diversify. And what they also need to get ready for bringing new people in. It's like the analogy is that you have a group of friends who've been friends for years. You go to the same places, you go to the same restaurants, you go to the same parties. And you bring one or two people in who are totally different from that. That's the whole point of diversity, right? Mm -hmm. And they come in and it's like Mars and Venus. So getting the board ready for it, people are going to come in with their opinions. People are going to come in bringing their resources. People are going to come in and connect you with things you didn't have before. And you need to also know how to respect their opinions. Before you start adding people, the board themselves should develop the process that works and that they will invest in in an ongoing way. It can't be one or two people. That's, you know, hearkening back to the work that Rachel Moore did with our uh, nominating and governance committee chair. It was a long process that they involved not just the committee in, but the entire board about this process that they were using to reconstruct the board, which um, eventually became almost 40%, increased from four to 40% people of color on our board. So that's a, that it was a huge step, but it's not over. It's continual. Right. Every single board meeting we talk about. It. I used to say, make room at the table. Now I say, just build a bigger table mm -hmm. of ideas and opportunities and exploring what is out there. So developing this process of not just recruitment, but also preparing room at the table and preparing for new people, new ideas, new perspectives, new worldviews to come to the table. Is that the equity part of diversity, equity, and inclusion? The equity on the board specifically means that everybody's voice is, to me, everybody's voice that's on the board is valued. It doesn't mean that just because the person of color says something that you all have to agree with it, but you have to agree to listen to it and take it into consideration as much as you would anybody else's. I was on a on an AIDS advisory group and the group didn't actually want to talk about the fact that HIV and AIDS was still a real thing in the community. And I'm like, well, you don't need me. <laughs> If that's what you're good, you, you just want me to help you raise money. And it's impossible for me to help you raise money about an illness, an issue, if you don't want to talk about what the what is. All right. Yeah. When you bring on people that are different than the old crowd, you need to be extra, extra mindful of them answering the question for themselves. Why am I here? Right. <laughs> And uh, to and you know what Andrew is saying, you know if they if they come up with like oh I'm the token, like what, what who would want to be on that board? Exactly. I I want to say something about what I think is really important that we don't talk about enough, and it's rooted in the fact that we are social animals and groups behave in ways in groups that we don't behave in as individuals, and I think it's very telling in a group of people that are that are boards, that if you have what I like to call a critical mass of people that wanna move in a different direction, then that is what's gonna take the direction forward. It's not one person, it's not two people, depending on how large the board is or how, how large the active members of the board are, is what is this sort of tipping point of the number of people that you need heavily invested in the agenda to move it forward. Because depending on how large your organization is, also, you know, obviously, you know, if you, if you have a small organization, it's gonna be a small number. But if you're working at a large organization with a large board, you're gonna need to calculate in moving an agenda, how many people do I really need and who are they? Who are the voices that I can get on board with this agenda and, and help them with their investment in it? Because 
the way to keep it moving forward is not the lone vo voice in the wilderness. It always fails that way yeah. because it's always on that person and you don't want to put it on the one person of color that's on your board. Right. You, you need to have it sh be shared with a group of leaders who take it to heart and really keep, keep it lifted up and on the agenda consistently. Hi, this is Curtis Schmidt, producer of the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange. If you're a nonprofit professional who has questions about your program, or maybe you feel like you've taken your advocacy, fundraising, or membership effort as far as you can and you need some fresh ideas, then we have a special offer for you today. NPFX podcast listeners can get a free 30-minute consultation with IPM Advancement, no strings attached, when you go to free.ipmadvancement.com. Just enter a few details and an IPM team member will contact you to follow up. It's that easy. That website again is free.ipmadvancement.com. That's F R E E.ipmadvancement.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to talk to you soon. Now let's return to the episode. In 2020, we saw a few things that had a big impact on DEI. COVID-19 had a disproportionate impact on communities of color. The murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others created this big awareness of the importance of DEI in organizations and diversity around the board table. And I'm curious now, from your perspectives, if that awareness is being sustained or if we've seen some sort of DEI burnout in the nonprofit sector. Burnout and resentment. <laughs> I mean, yeah, 2020, where a whole bunch of stuff was happening. COVID, you saw George Floyd get murdered in your living room. You saw people charging the Capitol. You saw that kind of stuff, right? And everybody went out and said, oh, we have to have DEI. Mm -hmm. Man, we're going to take a media hit if our board is not diverse. And they go through that and they never really wanted to do it in the first place. And they're not really committed to it for the long haul. They resent it. You could just see on, on the faces of people sometimes when you say DEI, they roll their eyes and say, oh, no, not that again. <laughs> and my prediction was DEI had 15 minutes of fame because it was trendy. Nobody, nobody wanted to be accused of not being diverse and inclusive. And so, of course, I haven't done a study on this, but based on what I have seen so far, those programs are dropping like flies. People went out and hired diverse executive directors. So they say, see, we have a diverse executive director, or see, we've got an executive board. And what I'm seeing is a lot of the things that we have talked about in terms of not setting the expectations or not being able to grow and really institutionalizing that. So it's not some new shiny penny, but it's a part of the way that the board and organization does business. They didn't do that. So it's not institutionalized yet. So it is up to all of us to keep saying we need a bigger table and we need to invite people in their full authentic selves to speak their minds and tell their truths. Josephine. Yeah, I was going to say too, I think it depends on the condition of the commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion access principles before you even got to 2020. And I think that there were things happening. There were things in motion, at least where I live, that the stuff that happened in 2020 just gave us more wind in the sail yeah. and, and helped push um, the agendas we were already working on forward. So for example, in Los Angeles County, there was a whole DEI movement happening 
And now it's sort of, there's a policy at the county level. There's, you know, it goes through all of the arts organizations and the way they're funded and how they have to report. So there's been some, some shifts that I think, you know, at, at the policy level that were able to be achieved. And, you know, um, of course, there's tons of the, the bad examples um, that Andrea talks about. You know, one of the, the saddest things that I think that's happened that's causing the resentment is a lot of organizations knee jerk, grab, a, you know, a, a qualified brown or black person or whomever and put them in an executive leadership position, but then give them no support to do their job. Exactly. And then they they burn out, they run screaming, they run into all kinds of obstacles, and um, the board is not there for them right. with the commitment that they had. They only, you know, so I think there's there's too many stories like that. And um, that's why, you know, I just sound like a broken broken record. It it takes effort. It's an ongoing process, it's an ongoing commitment, and it can never be something that's one and done. Yeah, exactly. I have a couple of other points that I think are important for the field to be thoughtful about. One is what we're facing as well is a generational divide between, this is very, very generalized, okay? So I'll, I'll admit to this being generalized. What we're facing is the age and demographic of the executive leadership and the board versus the staff at the kind of non-executive and, and managerial and below levels. And that young people are really, really fired up about this mm -hmm. in a way that a lot of us continue to be <laughs> uh, when we've gotten long in the tooth, but that um, we have to recognize that that generation is taking our place and we need to sustain our organizations partly for them. Right. If we want our organizations and our field to be robust and thriving and relevant, then we have to look to them for the energy to help transform us. And remember that we're going away. This is going to be what they inherit. And so they're not just the, the noisy younger staff saying, make this change now. They are the inheritors of what we're building. And that's a super important thing for us to keep in mind. And I also would say this, the other point is, and Andrea knows, kind of know exactly what I mean, because she's turned down being on boards. If you are going after diverse board member, be prepared to tell them what you're doing. Don't just expect them to be like, oh, oh, I'm so flattered that you asked me to be part of your board. Be prepared for questions like, do you have a board committee? Do you have a diversity statement? What's the composition of your staff and your board with respect to the diversity that you're looking for? What kinds of programs do you do? Who, you know, people, people who are sought after for boards because we happen to be somewhere in the Venn between what people are looking for and, and these you know, nominating and governance committee work, we're not gonna just say, oh yeah, great, because it's my time that I'm gonna give you and it's precious time, and it's my reputation that you want. So I need to decide for myself when I'm being asked to be on the board, do I wanna push that rock up that hill all by myself because they're telling me they don't have any of these things? No, so I need to, you, you need to give me some stuff that shows me you have done your homework. I agree with that. And I would say that in some cases, especially if the boards are not quite in agreement, that they need to bring in a consultant to talk them through it if they don't have the skills to do it well. Because if you do it and you don't do it well, you're going to sort of ruin everybody's reputation too. But the one thing that I didn't say, we didn't talk about is, especially with this intergenerational passing the torch, mm -hmm. is that I would like to see boards also think about cross mentoring young people do not know how to be on boards at this point and older people do not know how to work with young people to get stuff done they're still in the do as i say mode and that you know that turns the younger people off but josephine is 100 percent correct we think we're going to be around forever but we're not 
And so we need to figure out a way to cultivate. I'll never forget, I was on a board and they brought some young people in and it was a diverse group of young people and they had great ideas. And in the very first meeting, they started peppering us with ideas. Even I was taken aback at first because when I came up through the ranks, it was like you needed to learn the room before you jumped in. That's not the way that young people are doing it. They figure if you invited them to be there, you wanted them to talk and tell you what they thought. And that was a whole paradigm shift for a bunch of us. I'm like, wait a minute, somebody needs to take you under. No, maybe they need to take me under their wing too. Yeah. Because I had a moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I and I think you you are exactly right. And there is there is that that sort of generational divide. And my kids range from eighteen to twenty seven. And let me tell you, I have learned a lot by listening to them to sort of take a beat, take a step back, and stop being dad for a moment and let them do their thing. Because listen, that 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 generation, they know how to do their thing, and they know how to have an impact in ways that we couldn't even have imagined at their age. So for those organizations and, and, and the, the leaders of those organizations who are listening to this podcast, who are committed and want to move down the road towards diversity and equity and inclusion, where do they start? I think it all starts with your own assessment of your situation and seeing, okay, if I'm on the board and I'm not the chair, who else might be interested in this agenda? How do we engage the chair if that person is not leading the conversation? I think I'm, I'm sort of circling around the same concept of critical mass is how do you start building some, another concept I love is centrifugal force. You know, how do you start building motion that builds power? And if you're executive leader, you kind of need to do the same thing with the board members where you think there's the most heat to start some kind of motion. If the board doesn't themselves generate and maintain that motion, you know, I, it's not going to work. So you, so you have to figure out how do I get this thing to turn with people that are going to be there with me helping to turn it. Right. And that's the very first step. And, and kind of going back to what Andrea said, if maybe that assessment is, I get a little, there's a little heat there, a little heat there. I don't know. I can't carry this myself, but there's not enough, you know, other sources that are going to help me move this. Start talking to consultants that do this work and see if you can get somebody to help you think through what is the strategy to at least stand up in this and start to make a path for yourself and your organization with your allies to the place that's going to get you basically to the first point. And um, because there's, you know, you have to start and you have to start somewhere and maybe you need some help. Great. And with that, we're going to have to wrap up and end the show with that answer. But Andrea Collier and, and Josephine Ramirez, thank you so much for all of your input today on this topic of diversifying the boardroom. Can you tell us briefly, Andrea, where can listeners find out more about you? I am on social media, but if anybody wants to touch base with me, I'm andycollier11 at gmail.com. Terrific. Thank you. And Josephine Ramirez, where can our listeners find out more about you? They can look at the musiccenter.org website and see the work that we're doing to move our programs into more relevance, more diversity, more being more reflective of what LA County looks like. And and always can be reached via my email address, very simple, jramirez at musiccenter.org. Super. Thank you both for joining us today for a very important conversation. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It was awesome. That concludes this episode of the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange. Thanks to our panel for sharing their insights and expertise. If you'd like to learn more about our panel members or any of the organizations or resources featured in this episode, we will include links in the show notes. If you like this podcast, we would love your help spreading the word. 
first, please subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app, so you always know when a new episode is released. Second, forward the episodes you like to friends and colleagues, or share them on social media. Word of mouth is one of the best ways you can help us reach more nonprofit professionals like yourself. And if you use Apple Podcasts or Audible, please leave us a review. Positive reviews are how many listeners decide whether or not to try out a new podcast. We appreciate your help. For suggestions on topics, guests, or nonprofit organizations you'd like to hear on the podcast, send an email with the subject heading NPFX suggestion to contact at ipmadvancement.com. For back episodes and more resources like white papers, infographics, and blog articles, please visit the free IPM Advancement Nonprofit Resource Library at ipmadvancement.com forward slash resources. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.